Curious Lloyd. With the fragment of a human kidney sent in the mail to the police came a letter. I send you half the kidney I took from one woman and the other piece I fried and ate. The writer's return address from hell. It was the fall of 1888 and all of London instantly knew that the gruesome missive came from Jack the Ripper who had just slashed to death his fourth known victim, 43 year old Catherine Eddowes. All four women had been pathetic prostitutes, aging and worn, forced to ply their degrading trade in the slum district known as Whitechapel. A veritable cesspool of the most wretchedly impoverished people. It had narrowed streets and alleys that led through a filthy maze of gin shops, brothels and opium dens. Fewer than half the children survived to the age of five. Up to seven people were packed into each tiny room of the rubbish strewn warren. To fend off starvation in desperate circumstances, many young women had had no alternative but to become streetwalkers. Such women, for unexplained reasons, were the prey of the Ripper, who was never identified nor apprehended. Death in the Foggy Gloom The first victim was 42-year-old Mary Ann Polly Nicholas, whose throat was slit on the night of August 31st. As she lay dying in the grimy little alley, her killer ripped open her abdomen with his 10-inch knife. Eight days later, Dark Annie Chapman, 47, already weakened from tuberculosis, was dispatched in precisely the same manner with the same type of instrument. Now people recalled an earlier murder of Whitechapel prostitutes. Since she had merely been stabbed to death, police saw no likely connection. But the public felt otherwise and raised a frightened outcry that put pressure on the police to send reinforcements to the slum district. Private detectives and civilian volunteers eagerly enlisted in the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, set up by concerned London business interests. With the mounting fear came an expose of the dark side of Victorian life. Comfortable members of society had long ignored the cruel conditions forced upon the poor. In an age where sexual matters were not even mentioned, much less discussed, the so called proper people had turned a blind eye on the city's numerous streetwalkers. However, attention continued to be focused upon the killer, who had written his first letter bragging about his crimes in red ink and signed it with the name he bestowed on himself, Jack the Ripper. His taunts that the police would not catch him seemed well founded, through patterns in his crimes become evident. Medical examiners determined that he was left handed and knew a good deal about anatomy, obviously being skilled in extracting human organs with precision and gradually. It became clear that each murder was committed in the hours between 11pm and 4am, but this was not nearly enough evidence. Investigators took to hounding innocent people, merely because they were common criminals, known sex offenders or mentally ill surgeons and butchers. The harassment proved fruitless. The murderer's crimes became even more daring and more hideous, apparently interrupted just after cutting the throat of Elizabeth Stride, aged 45. The Ripper fleetly vanished into the night vapours shortly after midnight on September the 30th, leaving his victim dead but unmutilated. She was found clutching a bunch of grapes in one hand and sweets in the other. The witness who had stumbled upon the scene heard footsteps, but failed to catch a glimpse of the killer. Deprived of his familiar pleasure, the Ripper struck again within 45 minutes. His target this time was Catherine Eddowes, whom he killed and disemboweled, removing the kidney fragment sent through the mail. Astonishingly, a watchman on guard only several yards away heard nothing. Somehow, on a busy Saturday night in a teeming slum, with hordes of extra duty policemen and vigilance primed to nab him, the presumably blood-covered killer got away once again. A royal suspect for six weeks after the double murder, the Ripper did not make a move. Meanwhile, the police pursued an interesting lead. On the night that Stride and Eddowes had been killed, an officer had detained an elegantly attired gentleman, seen talking to a Whitechapel prostitute. When questioned, the well-spoken suspect, totally out of place in the dinghy district, passed himself off as a physician and convinced the policeman to let him go. Suddenly, rumours were spread in unchecked. Was the murderer a member of a high society who was driven by some mad compulsion, or had he become obsessed with the low life of the slums? For nearly a century, one popular suspect under this theory was the Duke of Clarence, a grandson of Queen Victoria. Newspapers of the time 
however, never published such speculation since the Duke was the eldest son of the heir to the throne, who later reigned as King Edward VII. Yet it was known that the Duke suffered from some form of mental instability. Those who support the theory that he was Jack the Ripper point out that the Duke was institutionalised after the last murder, never to be set free. He died in 1892. A convenient suicide. The most hideous of murders took place early in the morning of November the 10th at 3.45 a.m. That day Day, neighbors heard screams from the room of Jane, known as Black Mary, who was only 24 years old. When the landlord's servant edged inside at daylight, it was clear that the Ripper had taken advantage of the privacy afforded by his victim's quarters. Painstakingly, he had eviscerated the corpse, removed the heart and the kidneys, and laid the body parts neatly about the room. This brutal and bizarre murder was the last official attributed to Jack the Ripper. Within weeks, the police had closed the case without an explanation to the mystified public. In private, members of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee were told that the murderer had confessed before drowning himself in the Thames. To this day, however, the suicide note has not been shown to the public, nor have its contents been revealed. Many suspect that officials were perpetrating a cover-up to protect either the Duke of Clarence or a rogue police officer. As for the drowned man, a suicide had indeed pulled out of the Thames after the murder of Black Mary. On December the 3rd, John Druitt, a struggling lawyer who had become became obsessed with his mother's mental illness, killed himself by drowning. His suicide note has never been published and could well be the confession cited by the police in the closing case. Scion of a noble family in the medical profession, Druitt was well connected in England's upper class society, having attended a prestigious boarding school. His fellow members in an elite club, the Apostles, came from the nation's first families. All who knew the lawyer agreed that he detested women. On July the 1st, 1888, Mrs. Druitt was committed to a clinic for the mentally ill. Her son made visits to her regularly, perhaps increasingly fearful of his own mental stability. Whether he went there from his law offices or from a boys boarding school, where he had to eke out a living as a physical education instructor, Druitt would have had to have passed through the Whitechapel district to reach his mother's clinic. Did Druitt's fears and the hatred of women combine to produce the monster who called himself Jack the Ripper. By October, his brother William was noticing signs of mental strain and aberrant behaviour. On November the 30th, Druitt was summarily dismissed from his school job. To some theorists, it seems likely that the apostles used their high social position to protect the good name of one of their own. Perhaps they encouraged Druitt's suicide or even banded together to kill him, this putting an end to his barbaric and instable addiction. Also, according to this theory, they convinced the authorities to to suppress the true story and close the case. Jack the Ripper was suspected of as many as 14 murders. The unknown assailant was perhaps guilty of only five during his three month reign of terror. Fascinated with blood, choosing his victims so that the crime sites formed a cross on the map of Whitechapel, Jack the Ripper will probably never be identified, much less understood. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and possibly subscribe and I will catch you Sunday with another video.